Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Good to see everyone here. I am Cody, and I'm glad to be here to worship with you. It's an honor to be with you. Would you join us? Would you stand with us as we launch into a time of worship? Remembering God's goodness, his mercy towards us. I encourage you all to sing along. Sing, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Until I met you. And I was breathing. But not alive. And all my failures I tried to hide. And all my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Until I met you. And you called my name. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, and out of the darkness, into your glorious day. And his mercy has saved our souls. Now your mercy has saved my soul. And his freedom is all we know. And now your freedom is all that I know. And the old has passed away. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, and out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, and out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. And I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Because when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. And you called our name, you called my name. And I ran out of that grave. And out of the darkness into your glorious day. You can be seated. Would you pray with me as we continue to worship? Father, we thank you for the truth of that song. Lord, that while we were dead, 
in our sin and trespasses. While we were enemies of yours, Christ died for us. Where we're approaching the week where we remember the important, most important events of history. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just help us right now to engage with you meaningfully as we remember the gospel message, as we remember that apart from you, Lord Jesus, we have nothing and we are nothing. And it is only by your strength, your power, your mercy that we are able to stand. And Lord, we just ask that as we sing, that our hearts will be turned to you in deep, deep gratitude and thanksgiving. You're worthy of all of our affection and praise, Lord Jesus. And so we give it to you now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, He would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure, and how great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one turn many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And it was my sin that held in there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is not boast, and I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Would you please rise? for the reading of God's word. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 130. 
a song of ascents. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait. And in his word do I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. You join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity this morning to worship you, to gather with your people in your name, to call out to you, to celebrate that you reign in our lives in this world. And we celebrate that together. We belong to you and to your kingdom. And we're thankful this morning. And we ask as we move forward with the program that you would cause our, our hearts to be open, that your spirit would speak, we would have ears to hear, and that we'd be changed by your word this morning. We entrust ourselves, our lives, our futures, our hopes, ourselves into your hands and submit ourselves to the work of your spirit this morning. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this special chapel service. And some may not know that it's special, but it is. It's our annual Dear Hester lecture series. And this year, we tried uh, something new. The faculty, you know, we, we have innovative ideas sometimes. You know, so those theological education is very traditional. We said, why don't we have the speaker come earlier and give the lecture earlier in the day, and then our uh, classes at our meeting could come and benefit from the lecture, and then the content of the lecture could be illustrated in the chapel sermon. So that's what we're doing today. So our speaker, Dr. Stephen Rummage, uh, already spoke once, gave the, the formal lecture, and now is the proclamation of God's word, putting it into practice. Uh, for those who weren't here, that lecture, I think, I've been told, will be available online, and the topic was the value and use of illustration and expository preaching. And I would encourage you, if you weren't here for that first lecture, to, to watch it. I've, I've listened to many lectures in my life on preaching, and rarely um, has it, have I been impacted that much. I haven't spoken yet with a, um, my heart was burning within me with a desire to preach, to proclaim the gospel as I was listening. And not only that, I felt uh, confidence that next time I preached, it would be more effective because of what I was learning. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, listen to that uh, when you get a chance. Um, and I'll pass it on for the introduction to the speaker. And I would echo those words. It was a fantastic lecture on using illustrations in preaching, and I would commend it to you as well. Our speaker now for the chapel hour is Dr. Stephen Rummage, the pastor of Quail Springs Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, one of the largest and most influential churches in our denomination. He has pastored also in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, and Louisiana. Uh, Stephen is the author of several books and the founder and weekly speaker of the radio teaching ministry called Moving Forward. He holds MDivs from, uh, an MDiv from Southeastern and a PhD in New Orleans. And as I said earlier in the lecture time, unfortunately, no degree yet from Gateway Seminary. We'll work on it, though. He's here with his wife, Michelle, today. They have an adult son and his wife who live in Tampa, Florida. Would you welcome to the preaching platform now, Dr. Stephen Rummage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Orge. And to the faculty and staff, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And to everyone who's part of the Gateway Seminary family, I am just honored to be able to stand in front of you and to open God's Word together with you. So take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me, please, to the first Psalm, Psalm 1. And today I want to talk to you about the marks of a blessed life. Some years ago when our family was living in Florida and it would get really hot in the summertime, we would try to take 
a few days in the summer to get away from the Florida heat and to maybe get into some mountains. The closest mountains we could usually find were in uh, Georgia. Uh, and so we went one year to uh, an area up in Georgia, Blue Ridge, Georgia, and had a great time together. My wife, our son, who was probably about 14 or 15 years old at that time, and we just had, had a great time together. And one of the things that my wife had scheduled for us to do while we were there in the mountains of Georgia was to go and inner tube down the Tacoa River. And so it was the second time that I had ever been inner inner tubing. I'd really just never done that before. And so we we got to the place, we rented the big inner tubes, and we loaded up on the bus, and he drove us about two miles upstream, and he was getting ready to let us out. And I said, well, you know, what, what, is there anything, any instructions you need to give me about inner tubing. And he looked at me and he said, well, there's really not that much to it. He said, you just sit in the inner tube and, and it'll just float you down the river. And he said, you know, you'll float, take you about an hour and you'll see the place where everybody gets out and you just get out there and it'll give you a good ride. And I, I learned he was right. There is not a high level of skill set that you need to have to inner tube down a river. You just basically sit in that inner tube and let that river use the seat of your pants to polish every rock in your path as you make your way down the river. It doesn't take that much, but I did learn that it's possible to get stuck. You can mess it up. As simple as it is, you can mess it up. You can wind up getting out of the main stream of the river and wind up against the bank somewhere and you can get stuck. Or you can wind up in a shallow place somewhere where you quite literally bottom out and you have to push yourself off because you get stuck. Or you might wind up in a pool where you, uh, you're not really making any progress anymore. You're just going around in circles. And so you can get stuck, but the river is always flowing. And if you stay in the current of that river, you will go where that river wants to take you. In much the same way, the stream of God's blessing is always flowing. And it's always flowing in the same direction. And if you're in the stream of God's blessing, then your life will go where He wants to take you. But having said that, it is possible to mess things up. It's possible to get out of the stream of where He wants you to be and wind up side-railed over, uh, over to the banks somewhere or, or to wind up in a shallow place in your spiritual life where you stop making progress or to wind up in some stagnant pool where you're just going around in circles. But if you stay where God wants you to be, He promises that He'll take you where He wants to take you, and you'll experience the blessing on, his, on your life that He desires for your life. That's what Psalm 1 presents to us. It presents to us what it looks like to live a life in the stream of God's blessing. Psalm 1 is different from every other psalm in the book of Psalms in this regard. It was written specifically for the purpose of being the first psalm. There are other psalms that were written at different times in the history of the life of the people of Israel. Some of the the psalms are very, very ancient even within the book, the, the psalm of Moses after the parting of the Red Sea. Some of the psalms are deeply personal psalms, psalms that... David wrote as he reflected on his own life with God and what God did in his life as he followed the Lord. Some of the Psalms were written for the purpose of the corporate worship of God's people, even as they made their way to the temple to worship him, the Psalms of Ascent. But Bible scholars tell us that Psalm 1, in all likelihood, was written as the book of Psalms was being brought together for the purpose of being the first Psalm and setting the table for what it looks like to live a life that God can bless. I want us to stand together as we read God's Word together, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 1. The Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so 
but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I ask you now that you would move me out of the way. And Lord, speak a word to your people in this place today. Lord, show us how to live our lives in the stream of your blessing. God, I pray that today you would encourage and strengthen us. And by your Holy Spirit, that you would transform us more into the image of Jesus Christ. For Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Holy name. And brothers and sisters, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. I want us to look at this passage of Scripture together, and I want to talk to you about four marks of a blessed life. It's just really simple message, a simple outline. Four marks of a blessed life. Here's the first mark. The Bible says a blessed life is marked by your direction. Marked by your direction direction, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the man, and before we go on any further, just think with me for a moment about that word blessed. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. It's a word that speaks of supreme happiness and blessing and the favor of God. In the original language of Scripture, that word blessed is actually in the plural to emphasize the intensity of the blessing. It's almost impossible to translate it fully into English, but we might say it this way. Oh, the blessednesses of this kind of person. Oh, the happinesses of this kind of person. Blessed is the man. And then the Bible begins describing the life of this kind of blessed person by describing his direction, and it shows us what his direction is by telling us what his direction is not. Blessed is is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The Bible says that a blessed person, a person who lives his life in the stream of God's blessing, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. You might want to underline the word wicked in your Bible there. It appears several times in this text. You see it in verse 1, again in verse 4, again in verse 6 of the text. The the word wicked there comes from a a Hebrew word that's connected to the idea of breaking loose. Someone who is wicked according to God is someone who breaks loose from what God wants. Who breaks loose from what God says. It's just a reminder, you don't have to be what this world would consider particularly wicked to be what God says is wicked. If you break loose from what God says and what God wants and what God desires, that's wickedness. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel or under the advice of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Do you notice the progression there? Or maybe we would call it a digression. He goes from walking to standing to sitting. He just gets more and more involved in sin. At first, he's walking. And here, walk has to do with your manner of life. At first, he's walking and listening to the counsel of of the wicked. And then he's standing in the the way of of sinners. That's become his group. And, And then he's sitting. He's saying, this is who I am. God, you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm sitting here. This is where I am. He's sitting in the seat of those who would scoff and scorn God's Word. That's how sin works. It affects the direction of your life, and you find yourself getting more and more entrenched in your sin until you're walking and standing and then sitting in a place where you never thought you would be. Most of us don't dive into sin off of a diving board so much as we slide into sin on a sliding board. We make one little compromise after another with sin until we find ourselves in a place we never thought we'd be. My friend Dewey got married when he was probably in his mid-30s. He'd been a bachelor for a while. He married a young woman named Beverly, and they'd been married for maybe a year or so, and Beverly said, Dewey, you're gone a lot. I would love it if if we could get a dog. 
And Dewey said, I've never had a dog. I don't want a dog. And she said, well, just, it just means so much to me if we could get a dog. He said, i tell you what. We, we can get a dog, but now the dog's going to be an outside dog. I'm not going to have an inside dog. <laughs> and so uh, they, they got the dog, and the dog stayed outside. And one night, February night, it was cold, and it was rainy, and Dewey and Beverly were getting ready to go to bed and go upstairs to their bedroom, and that dog was right outside the glass door downstairs and just was whining and crying and cold and wet and shivering. You know how pitiful a cold, wet dog can be. <laughs> and Beverly said, can't we just let the dog into the house tonight? It's, it's just so pitiful outside. And Dewey said, well, he can come in tonight, but now when we go upstairs, that dog's staying downstairs. He's not coming upstairs with us. Please try not to get ahead of me on this story. <laughs> and so they let the dog in that night, and soon every night the dog was coming in. In fact, the dog was no longer an outside dog. The dog became an inside dog. But when they would go to bed at night, the dog would stay downstairs, Dewey and Beverly would go upstairs. And then one night as they were going upstairs, they looked down at the bottom of the steps, and that dog was just looking up at them like this. You know how pitiful a dog can be. And, and Beverly said, Dewey, the dog's downstairs wandering around, doesn't know what to do with himself when we go to bed. Can he just come upstairs? He said, he can come upstairs, but now when we go to bed, we're closing the door. He's not coming into the bedroom with us. <laughs> and then he would come in, and then one night, as they closed that door the, to the bedroom, that dog put his nose in that little crack at the bottom of the door and just <laughs> sniffed. And, and Beverly said, can't we just let him in and... And Dewey said, he can come in, but he is not sleeping in the bed with us. <laughs> the dog lived to be 13 or 14 years old. Eventually, Dewey had to build steps for the dog to get into the bed <laughs> because he could no longer jump up in the bed by himself. Have you ever noticed how sin will dog you? Yeah. And how you'll make one little compromise after another until you find yourself in a place you never thought You'd be a, a blessed man, a person who keeps his life or her life in the stream of God's blessing is marked by a direction that seeks to please God. Because when there's one area of compromise in your life, Satan will always build a bridge to that area of compromise. If you owned a thousand acres and you gave 999 of those acres away, but you kept one acre in the middle of that land for yourself, you build a road to get to that land that still belongs to you. And the devil will do the same thing with an uncompromised or an unsurrendered area in your life. He'll build a bridge to it. And you'll find yourself continually struggling with that area of sin in your life. And it can destroy you. The Bible says that a blessed life is marked by your direction. Secondly, the Word of God says a blessed life is marked by your delight. By your delight. Notice what the Word of God says in verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. A person who lives in the stream of God's blessing is marked by his delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord. The word delight there means to find happiness and joy and to have a deep desire for something. His delight is in the law, in the Torah of the Lord. In the law of the Lord, the, the instruction, the Torah of the Lord. That, that word law refers to God's instruction. And then more specifically, it, it refers to the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah of the Lord. I think about that. And I know that the word refers to all of the word of God, but I think about it. his delight is in the Torah of the Lord. I read the book of Genesis. I delight in the book of Genesis. I read the book of Exodus. I delight in most of the book of Exodus. Somewhere near the end, the, the delight begins to diminish. And then I come to Leviticus. Well, it talks about the blood sacrifice and points forward to Jesus. I can delight in it. Then I come to Numbers and Deuteronomy. And his delight, the Bible says, is in the Torah, the instruction, the law of the Lord. One of the things that brings blessing to our lives is when we have a genuine delight in every part of God's Word. Even in the parts that maybe don't resonate with, with, with us emotionally as much as other parts, but we delight in the law of the Lord so that we meditate on it. That word means to murmur, 
to chew over something. In it, he meditates. In his law, he meditates day and night. There's a consistent meditation and murmuring, reminding ourselves of what God has said because we delight in the law of the Lord. My wife asked me something this morning. She asks me just about every morning. That question was this. Did you take your multivitamin today? And the answer was, no, I'm not taking my multivitamin today. When we go on a trip, she counts out my multivitamins, puts them in a little plastic bag, tells me where they are, and still she has to ask me, did you take your multivitamin today? No, I have not taken my multivitamin today. She has to remind me about it every day. And I think one of the reasons why is, I never feel that multivitamin kicking in. <laughs> I never take it and say, wow, multivitamin. That never happens. <laughs> and so it's really easy for me to neglect that multivitamin. On the other hand, nobody has to remind me about my first, second, or third cup of coffee. Never. Because I can feel that. Here's my question. Is God's word to you more like that multivitamin or more like the cup of coffee? And here's the truth. Sometimes it's like Either one of those things. Sometimes you don't feel it kicking in. Sometimes you read it and, and you know it's God's Word and you praise the Lord for it, but you don't feel the jolt. Sometimes you do. But why is my wife insisting on me taking that multivitamin? Because there is a cumulative effect. My doctor says that every system in my body will function better when I consistently take that multivitamin. In the same way spiritually, there's a cumulative effect. Even when you're not feeling it. Even when there's no jolt from reading God's Word for you that day. There's a cumulative effect so that every spiritual system in your life works better when you delight in the law of the Lord. So in His law, He meditates day and night. Why? Because He delights in it. When we open this book, God Himself is revealing Himself to us. We're learning His character. We're learning His promises. We're learning His purposes. We're learning who He is and who we are in Him. So that we can say, yes, Lord, my delight is in your law, and I meditate in your law day and night. A, a life that's blessed by God, that's in the stream of God's blessing, is marked by your direction, it's marked by your delight. Thirdly, the Bible says a life that, God's bless, that God blesses is marked by your distinctiveness. Marked by your distinctiveness. Look in verse 3 of the text. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does, he prospers. He is like a tree. I want to confess two things to you. The first thing I want to confess to you, the first sermon I ever prepared and studied for as a seminary student was from this passage. The second confession is this. This is not that sermon. I wouldn't want to preach that sermon to you. But uh, I do remember coming to this verse. And I, I'm just a beginning seminary student. And I come to that phrase in verse 3, He is like a tree. And as I was asking questions of every verse in this text and every phrase, one of the questions that I asked was, what kind of tree is this? Is He talking about an oak tree? Is He talking about a palm tree? Is He talking about an olive tree? Is He talking about a fig tree? What, what, is He talking about a cedar of Lebanon? Is He talking about a cypress tree? What kind of tree is this? And so I went to the library of our seminary and I, I looked at every resource that I was able to use and, and after I had finished, I found out that the deep meaning of the Hebrew word for tree here is, go ahead and tell me what it is. Tree. <laughs> Ordinary average, run-of-the-mill, nothing special about it, tree. And man, that encouraged me. The only thing that makes this tree distinctive is where it is planted and what it produces and how it prospers. Notice what it says. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, Just an ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill, nothing special about it, tree planted by the streams of water. Sometimes in the Word of God, when the Bible talks about water, it talks about water for drinking. And Jesus compared water for drinking 
to the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John chapter 7, he spoke of, of living water and drinking. And the Bible says he was referring to the Spirit. Planted by the rivers of water. Part of that means that I am seeking to be filled with and nourished by and led by and controlled by the Holy Spirit day by day. Just an ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill, nothing special about me, me. But I want to be planted by the streams of water because when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, God will do something in my life. And God will use me in ways far beyond myself. And then, then water is sometimes used in the Bible to talk about the Word of God. Water for washing in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 is described as the Word. The Word is like water that washes us. And so not only am I drinking in the Holy Spirit of God and seeking to be filled by the Spirit, I am also being washed day by day by the Word of God. And then Jesus talked about a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. He compared that to a hunger and thirst for water. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. They shall be satisfied. Just an ordinary, average tree, but planted by the streams of water because it's planted in the right place. It produces what God wants it to produce. Continue reading with me in verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. There's a perennial freshness and productivity. It yields its fruit in its season. When the Bible talks about fruit, sometimes it talks about the fruit of godly character in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit described in Galatians. Sometimes the Bible talks about fruit as people who we are able to lead to faith in Jesus Christ, fruit for our labors, and that's fruit. Sometimes fruit is described in the Bible as a lifestyle of praise. Hebrews talks about, let us continually therefore offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess His name. Here's what the Bible is saying. When we take care of where we're planted, God will take care of what we produce. So that in all we do. Look at what it says. In all He does, He prospers. Does God want you to prosper? According to the Bible, if you desire to prosper in that which God desires to prosper, God desires to prosper you. If you're trying to prosper on your own terms, God's not interested in that. He doesn't sign on for that. But if you desire to prosper in God producing His fruit in your life, He promises in all that this blessed person does, he prospers. Why? Because he's seeking the thing that God most desires to prosper. He'll use you when you're planted in the right place and producing his fruit. When we lived in Florida, we discovered at the back of our property, there was a lemon tree. We, we didn't know, but there was a, a lemon tree. And, and, and I, I came back to that tree one day, and, and it was the first time I really noticed it. And the reason I noticed it, there was a broken branch that was bowed down close to the ground and was just filled with lemons. And it was broken, I'd say three quarters of the way through it was broken. And some of you might know how to mend a broken branch that way. I, I didn't, and I still don't. The only thing I needed to do was saw off that branch. It was, it was broken. But I didn't want to saw it off because... There, was so many, there were so many lemons on that tree. So I, I picked those lemons and filled up this big basket of, of lemons and brought them in the house. More lemons than we would ever need. But I, I came back not too long after that and that broken branch was still producing lemons. And all that season, it just kept on producing lemons. And then the next year, that broken branch kept producing lemons. And it just reminded me of something. God can bring fruitfulness through our brokenness. If we're planted in the right place and seeking for Him to use us even in our brokenness, He'll prosper us. He'll use us for His glory. In fact, I got lemons off that branch that I never would have been able to get off of them if that branch had been standing up straight. Because it was bowed low. I could get something from it. It, it. it was distinctive. It was producing its fruit. And so the Bible says that 
A life that God blesses is marked by your direction, your delight, by your distinctiveness. Then I want you to see one final thing. The Bible says a life in the stream of God's blessing is marked by your destination. Your destination. Look in verse 4 of the text. The wicked are not so. Those who break loose from what God desires are, are not like this righteous person at all. Instead, they're like the chaff that the wind drives away. Many of you know how they would take the, the grain and they would, they, would, they would beat it so that the, the grain itself, the kernel, was separated from the husk, from the chaff, and then they'd, they'd throw the, the grain and the chaff up in the air and the wind would blow, blow away that empty husk and leave the grain behind. The Bible says that the wicked, those who break free from what God desires, are like that chaff. There's just nothing there. It's a husk. It just, it just blows away. Therefore, verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It's just a reminder of something we see so many times in the Word of God. There are two roads and there are two destinations. There are those whose destination is eternity separated from God in hell. And there are those whose destination is to spend eternity with God in heaven. And here's one of the things I see in this text. You can tell what your destination is by the way you travel to that destination. The Bible says the wicked will not stand in the judgment. There's going to come a time when God judges and those who break loose from what He wants will not be able to stand before His judgment. Sinners will not be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous. There's going to be a separation between those who have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ and are therefore righteous and those who have stayed on the path of sin without turning from their sin and turning to Jesus. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. That word way refers to the, the journey that you're taking. The Bible says the way of the wicked will perish. You can tell where someone's headed by the way they travel to their destination. We were traveling out to California just a few weeks ago, and uh, we were flying into the airport in Anaheim, and we, we left Oklahoma City. We went to, to Phoenix, and when we got on the airplane in Phoenix, all of a sudden, I saw people who looked different. I'm talking about what they had on. They looked different than the people who had left the airport with us from, from Oklahoma City. And here's what looked different. I saw grown men wearing Donald Duck hats. And I saw little girls dressed up like princesses. And I saw men and women and people of all ages wearing Mickey Mouse t-shirts. I did not have to ask them where they were going. I could tell by the way they were traveling what their destination was. Here's what the Bible says. The way of the wicked and the way of the righteous look different. Their journey looks different because their destination is different. And by the way, I would also say that if you say your destination is heaven, but your journey looks like hell, then you need to ask the question, is my destination really heaven? A lot of people who call themselves Christians are traveling in a way that shows that, that heaven's not their destination at all. The way or the, the journey of the wicked will perish, but the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows your way. The word for know there is the word yada. It means a deep, intimate, perfect knowledge. The Lord knows your way. Even when you don't know your way. When you don't understand where this stream is taking you. The Lord knows your way. Even when you're in rough waters and you don't understand why. The Lord knows your way. Even when you feel like you've gotten stuck and maybe you're up against the bank of that river. The Lord knows your way. If you were to come to my church on a Sunday morning, after our second service, you might see standing to my left hand a man named Todd Craighead. 
And if you saw Todd, he would get your attention immediately because he just looks different. He's a little bit shorter than average, but that, that's not what gets your attention. What gets your attention is that you notice his arms are always at a 90 degree angle. And his hands are cupped. And one hand is, is upside down. And he has limited movement of his arms and hands. He'll shake your hand sort of like this. He walks without a brace or, or, or a cane or anything, but he, he walks with a limp. And so he will get your attention just when you see him. And if you were to talk to him, he might tell you his story. He's glad to tell you his story. He shared it with me one time. He said, I, I was born with a condition that was caused by a lack of movement in my mother's womb. It's not anything genetic, just a lack of movement in the mother's womb. As a result, when he was born, the doctors and those who were attending him didn't believe he would live for 24 hours. But he did live. And eventually he had surgery after surgery, 13 different surgeries before he was in first grade. To move his arms and to, to work with his legs, he had to learn how to walk two times. When, first when he was, was a, a little, little boy, and then later on after he had had multiple surgeries. He's able to walk and do what he's able to do now just because of the surgeries that he had. But he said, I've never let anything stop me at all. His dad was a woodworker. They'd be out in his dad's workshop, and his dad would give Todd something to do. And he said, my dad couldn't tell me how to do it because he didn't know how I was going to be able to do it in my condition. But he'd just give me something to do. He said, I figured out how to do it. He went to Oklahoma State University. His goal was to become a forest ranger. He got a degree in forestry and communication, graduated, went to work as a forest ranger in the National Park System. After he'd been doing that for a short period of time, he got a call inviting him to come back to Oklahoma where he served for years and years in the Oklahoma Wildlife Department. He hosts a television show that's on every week called Oklahoma Outdoors. He drives an SUV. I can't get up into this SUV. I don't know how he gets into it. He drives it and gets up into it himself. He hunts, he fishes, he does anything he wants to do. And he told me about when he first moved back to Oklahoma City. He said, I got to know a guy named Jeff Goodwin. He said, he said Jeff discipled me in the Bible and following Jesus. He said, and I discipled Jeff in hunting and fishing. He said, I taught him how to hunt and fish. He taught me how to follow Jesus. And he said, one day, we had gotten to know one another. We were at a Brahms restaurant, and um, we were sitting there eating. And he said, and I said to Jeff, Jeff, I know that you pray, and I know God answers you as you pray. I'd love it if you just pray about something. He said, there's a question that I struggle with, and that is, why did God make me the way he made me? He wasn't saying that out of bitterness. By this time, he had accomplished so many things that people never thought he would accomplish. Incredible attitude. It wasn't bitterness. He just wanted to know. Why did God make me the way he made me? He said, Jeff, would you just pray about that? Maybe God will show you something. Jeff said, I'll pray about it. The next week, they got back together, same restaurant. And uh, Jeff said, Todd, I think I've got an answer why God made you like he made you. And Todd said, well, Jeff, I've been praying about this for 20 years, but if God showed you in a week, go ahead and tell me. <laughs> Why did God make me the way he made me? He said, well, he said, let me ask you two questions. Jeff said, have you ever been out somewhere, maybe at a mall or shopping center, and somebody mistook you for somebody else? And Todd said, no, that's never happened. He said, nobody's ever seen anybody like me. Only one out of 10,000 people born have my condition. He said, I never saw anybody like me until I was a teenager. He said, so no, nobody has ever seen me and, and, and thought I was somebody else. He, Jeff said, that's what I thought. He said, let me ask you a second question. He said, have you ever been out and somebody comes up to you and you're talking and you remember them, but they don't remember you? He said, 
Never. He said, the opposite happens. People come up to me all the time because I'm the only person like me they've ever seen. And I can't remember who they are, but they've seen me one time. They remember me. And Jeff said, that's what I thought. He said, Todd, here's what the Lord showed me. God made you unmistakable and unforgettable. I don't know anything about you. I know this about you. God made you unmistakable and unforgettable. Just ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill, nothing special about you. You. And God says, I know your way. He sees you. He knows you. He has a purpose for you. And He will use you beyond what you could ever imagine as you simply say day by day, Lord, through Your Word, through the power of Your Spirit, through my hunger and thirst for Your righteousness as I plant myself by the rivers of water. God, because You know me, because my destiny is to spend eternity with you. God, I know that you're going to bless me as I stay in the stream of your blessing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for every person in this room. And thank you, Lord, that for every one of us, whatever our past, whatever our limitations are, whatever we think about ourselves, whatever Others may say about us, Lord, you look at us, and if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we have been made righteous through faith in Him, your word says that you know the way of the righteous. And so, Lord God, we pray that we would stay in your paths. We pray that we would stay in the stream of your blessing. And Lord God, I pray that you would use us for your glory. I pray, Lord, for men and women in this room who may feel forgotten. Lord, thank you. You never forget them. Thank you that you never mistake us for someone else and you never make mistakes in where you take us as we seek to follow you. And so, Lord God, use us to make a difference in the lives of others. Lord, use us to warn those who are perishing. To show them their need for Jesus that they might be saved. And then Lord, use us to encourage one another along the way. And we'll give you glory and honor, Lord, for all that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Stephen, for an excellent word today. Thank you for a fantastic lecture and for this follow-up message that's illustrated what you taught us this morning and also challenged us spiritually, so thank you for both things. Uh, just uh, two brief announcements. Number one, the next and really final major event on campus, uh, special event on campus, this semester will be April 14th and 15th when Kevin Van Hooser will be here for the Theology in and for the Church Conference sponsored by the Jonathan Edwards Center. So be sure you're checking on Eventbrite for details about that. Now we're moving into the Leadership Luncheon, the second announcement. Uh, if you have registered for the luncheon, go ahead and go through the lines and come into the Graves Center as quickly as possible. If you did not register, uh, Jacqueline or someone else from Student Services will be in the foyer. There are always people who registered who don't come, and uh, we can usually work you in if you want to stay and have lunch with us. Uh, about 12.15 or 12.20, I'll be interviewing uh, Dr. Rummage for about 40 minutes, and I have a series of questions about preaching and leadership that we'll do as we always do here at the Leadership Luncheons at Gateway. So uh, the lunches are ready, and we'll meet you in the Graves Center in just a few minutes. All right, thank you for being here today.